Oh, good evening again. You know, I just really want well welcome to everybody. Thank you a special uh, welcome to visit us tonight. And if it's your first time here, an even more special welcome. I am worn out with preaching the gospel. But now you really think you've only just come started. But I've been at my father's this week. I've spent seven days alone with my dad. My mum's been away. My dad's an unbeliever. <laughs> we get down to it sometimes. We have our moments. You see, my dad says, look at that tree, Nigel. God is in that tree. I worship that tree. That is God. And I say, no, Dad. God created, he made that tree. It's not him. He, he created it. It's part of his creation. And he says, well, no, son, he says, I worship the tree. And he goes on about trees. And I went, my dad carves wood. He's a wood carver. And I went and got one of his carvings. And I said, Look, Dad, you made this, you created this, yeah? But it's not you. Now, in 200 years' time, maybe someone will say, yes, this was carved by W.B. Turton in uh, uh, the beginning of the, yeah, in 2018 or whatever. But it's not him, is it? But even with this, I'm trying to show him that this is not him, you know? It's just something he made. It's just a piece of wood that he's fashioned. That's how it works sometimes, isn't it? You know, man got so puffed up and so prideful and so clever and intelligent that he thought he could do everything. And the scientists came together and they worked out how to create life. And they said to God, we don't need you anymore, God. We can do it all. Yeah? And they called him down and they said, we want to show you. We want to have a competition. And God came down. And being the gentleman that he is, he said, okay, you scientists. Let's see what you can do. You go first. And the scientists bent over and picked up some dust and we're about to put it in this test tube and God said, uh uh he said, get your own dust yeah, get your own dust it's God man God created everything heaven and earth he created us, yeah he created the tree and there's something of his beauty and majesty in a tree isn't there more so in us. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Tonight we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. If you want to, if you've got your Bibles or more Bibles. <coughs> Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. Which says, short and sweet. I'll try and keep this brief. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God then with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. We say, don't we, in the church, that to live a well-balanced, effective Christian life, then we need to put God first, yeah? Family second, and ministry third, yeah? <coughs> that means putting God, or loving him, more than we love our children, yeah? It's a tough one, isn't it? More than we love our wives, Mine's at the back there somewhere. And more than we love our husbands. And let's be honest, guys. 
How on earth are we going to love our wives as Jesus loves the church unless we're in a deep and intimate relationship with him? Unless we're willing to make ourselves available for his divine power to flow in and through us. Yeah? And how on earth are our wives going to submit to us unless they see Jesus living in us? Unless they can see something of Jesus in us? This divine process can only happen if we walk with him, talk to him, and meditate on him, and put into practice what he taught us every moment of our lives. Always. Are we willing then to put Jesus first? Are we ready to give him our all? To love, to honour, and to obey him at all times? <coughs> I believe that with many, and along with many others, that Jesus' return is imminent. Yeah? Sooner than we can imagine. He is coming for his bride. The church is the bride. And we are the church, shall we not? And the best is God. There is no other. We are the church. So do not be found wanting, do not be found sleeping when he comes, but be ready. 1 Corinthians 15 says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. We will suddenly find ourselves clothed in white linen, white and pure, dressed in splendour, a bride spotless and clean. We are his shining ones and we will be caught up with him at that moment. Listen to this. And miraculously, it starts snowing. Nothing so unusual about that, but it's August, for goodness sake. What's going on? And the old scene changes in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Everyone's garments are now brilliant white. And there is excitement and expectation and wonder. And everyone is filled with awe, except of course, Mrs. Quickly. Mrs. Quickly, maybe? Do we know that is? Mrs. Quickly runs off humiliated. She and her maid, she and her maid alone have not been transformed. Their garments are not washed clean and they scurry away from the wedding feast, clearly dressed in the wrong clothes. And then, Angelina, the new bride, steps forward out of the shadows. And as she does so, she is transformed and clothed in beauty. And I'm not ashamed to say that when I watched Nanny <coughs> McPhee with my dad on Thursday night, I shed a tear or two and had to scurry off to the bathroom rather quickly when it finished. And as I did so, I did notice my dad's hunky coming out as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should have stayed and cried together. You see, in that film I saw something of the marriage supper of the Lamb in this kind of rather sentimental and slushy story. But it was all there, that transformation, as Angelina goes to me. A groom, Jesus. And she's transformed and changed. A miracle takes place. That miracle is going to happen for us too one day. Yeah? It's already beginning to happen as we walk out our salvation in Jesus. Yeah? We're already being changed. I'm not the man I was when Louisa met me. 
Yes, we Someone say it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and that's good. You know, it was at a wedding when Jesus performed his first miracle, wasn't it? And he turned the world through into one. And at the end of Revelation, we see Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. You know, now is the time to seek out and develop a deeper, more intimate relationship with God than ever before. Now is the time to put him first and truly make Jesus Lord of our lives. When I was writing this, I was reminded of an old hymn. Some of you will know it. I should imagine most of you will. I won't sing it. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Moving on a bit. You know, in the armed forces, there's a, an order a, a, that's sometimes given twice a day, perhaps at dawn and, a, and again at dusk. And it's the order to stand to. Have you heard it? They say stand to. It doesn't mean you stand to attention and salute. You see, most attacks from the enemy come just before dawn or perhaps at dusk. So the order's given at four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, and all the battalion have to get up, put the battle dress on, and arm themselves, and get ready in case of an early morning attack. And you know, the church in these end times needs to develop a similar mindset. Putting God first above all else is being ready. It's being alert at all hours, day or night, for his glorious return. We cannot be found wanting. We can't be found sleeping. I'm thinking of the ten virgins in the Gospels, yeah? Some of them, when they woke, their lamps had gone out and they just weren't ready and they missed the greatest occasion that can ever take place <coughs> in the history of man. And that is the wedding supper of the Lamb. We need to assure, don't we? We need to be certain that we're going to be sat at that table with Jesus and our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I started with the familiar stain of putting God uh, before our families and ministry, but there is something or someone else who God has to come before, isn't there? And that's our very selves. All our own selfish desires, all our ambitions and plans. We must be constantly willing to lay everything down at the foot of the cross, to sacrifice our own dreams and goals for the greater good of his will. It's not always easy to do that, is it? <coughs> Oh Lord, we pray, let your will be done. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 38, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And again in Matthew 16, 24, we read that then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must first deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. So I ask you, are you simply following Jesus? And if so, what for? A free meal? Oh, Jesus was good at feeding the multitudes. Jesus was pretty good at putting a free meal on them, wasn't he? Or maybe it's seeing a miracle. Maybe you're looking and chasing after a miracle. A miracle right there in front of your very eyes. That's what excites you. That's what makes your hair stand on end. 
Oh, I heard he raised someone from the dead last week. I couldn't believe my eyes. And talking of eyes, you see that guy over there, he was blind as a bat from birth. Now he's got a job on the walls of Jerusalem as a watchman. He's got 20, 20 vision. <laughs> when God does something, he does it, you know, perfect, doesn't he? Are you getting my drift then? You see, people much like sheep will follow any fad or fashion popular at the time, won't they? And Jesus was certainly popular. He would have been quite a celebrity, wouldn't he, if he was around now? The television companies would have been ringing him up every day, wouldn't they? I wonder why he'd have made it that. I mean, everybody would have been talking about him and waiting and wondering what he would do or who he would upset next. Today, people would have wanted his autograph, wouldn't they? But you know the only place Jesus would write his name is on the tablet of your heart, and it would not be written in indelible ink, but in blood. You know, every time we break the bread and drink the wine, we remember that his name is written there, and that name will never be erased. The name that is above every name at which day every knee will bow as we've just seen. Every knee will bow before him. Amen. You see, Jesus didn't just say follow me, did he? First, there was a condition, a cost. A price to pay. He said to the rich young man, go, sell all you have, give the money to the poor, and then follow me. He said to Simon and Andrew, stop what you are doing, put down your nets this instance, and come, follow me. Leave your business. Leave it all behind, and come and follow me. And you know what? They heard the call. They knew who he was, and they did just that. And he says to us, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross, die to self, and follow me. He said to me, put down the drugs, Nigel, and leave behind your life of crime. The trickery, the lying, the stealing. And it was his grace that empowered me to do just that. Yes, grace flows freely like a river from Emmanuel's side. But do not be deceived into thinking that there is nothing required of you in becoming a disciple of Christ. You know, people are content just to follow, usually watch from a distance, from the sidelines. It's safer, isn't it? You see, when things begin to turn a little bit ugly, they drop away from fear of association. Aren't you one of his followers? Said the slave girl. Oh, not me, said Peter. And he swore with a curse that he'd never even met the man. And that's when their eyes met. And the next sound that was heard was a cock crowing. And Peter ran away, broken. So are you a disciple or a follower? To get... To put God first is to get to know him intimately and be willing to share about him whenever the opportunity presents itself. We have a saying, don't we? To really get to know someone is to walk a mile in their shoes. 
Are you willing to put his shoes on and walk a mile or two? What if that mile is the Via Dolorosa? That is the way of suffering or the way of grief. The road that Jesus walked which led him outside the city gate to Golgotha. Are you willing to walk with him, to worship him in the good times and the bad? If you were here last Sunday night, we had a, a, a team over from Rotherham, Ealing Church in Rotherham, and the worship leader, do you remember, he came and sat here. I said to him after he gave that testimony, no wonder you sat down to say that. Do you remember? He spoke of that incredible day when he woke up with his wife and they knew that their children, their sons, would be born that day. The child would come that day. And sure enough, by 4 p.m., she gave birth to twins and he was holding his firstborn in his hands. Oh, you know, what a feeling that must be. <laughs> and 49 hours later, that little boy drew his final breath again in his father's arms. He'd come, gone, hadn't he, from that uttermost top of the mountain experience to the very <coughs> bottom of suffering and bewilderment and agony and grief. One Thessalonians five sixteen says, "Be joyful always," doesn't it? Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances. Well, how can you do that? How can this guy give thanks when he is holding his little boy and the life's gone out of him? Remember, we're looking at putting God first. Now, this does not mean that John, who is baby boy was taken from him is to be thankful for his loss. Noah and his wife grieved and suffered bitterly that we like them can be thankful even in such tragic circumstances because our Father in heaven is there with us through all the suffering. He's there grieving with us. He's there holding us, comforting us. And what's more, he will comfort and heal our broken hearts. John's heart was healed, wasn't it? That was apparent last week. We could see the work that God had done in him. And this we can be thankful for. To put God first then is to invite him into our suffering, to share our deepest hurts with him. You know, the, the mistake people often make is turning away and blaming God when tragic circumstances break their hearts. They blame God. And how many times have I heard unbelievers declare, how can there be a loving God when there is so much suffering in the world? How can that be? But imagine, if you will, for a moment, imagine the hopelessness, the total despair and futility of life here on earth if there was no God. No God to call on when we go through any affliction or suffering. How much worse that would be. How it would be hopelessness. This is what Jesus says then in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. <coughs> what powerful words these are. And on hearing them, Scripture tells us many believers fell away at this teaching. Many turned their backs on Jesus and got on with their lives without him. Those that were looking for the free lunch, a meal ticket to heaven perhaps. The ones not willing to roll up their sleeves and join in and get involved and partnership with Jesus, simply gave up. 
Only those willing to become his true disciples kept going. They are the ones who will receive the prize when they finish their race and be crowned with glory and reign forever with Jesus. To partake of his flesh and drink of his blood is a divine mystery. But as I was writing these words, it came to me that in part they mean that if you are willing to accept this teaching, then somehow, some way, and at some time, you will share in his sufferings and will find yourself walking a little way down the road you travelled on. The road less travelled. Marked out with suffering. If they persecuted me, then you'll be next, said Jesus. Do not be discouraged, he said. I will be a shield to all who trust in me. It's my battle and I will secure the victory. The battle belongs to the Lord, doesn't it? And in another well-known verse we read, Do not be discouraged. You know, it's not all doom and gloom, being a Christian. It's not all suffering, is it? There's joy. Too. Do not the writer of Hebrews say that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And what joy there is for us too in knowing Jesus. There is no greater thing we see and the peace that can only be found in him can be ours. The peace that passes all understanding. You know, when I lived my own life and I looked into what I was into, all I ever wanted was to have peace in my life. And I never had it at all. I'd take pills and what have you, and drugs, until I was comatose, obliterated, unconscious. But there was no peace. Just forgetting, really, and oblivion, but no peace. There was no peace in my life until I started that relationship with Jesus. And then his peace came into me. And he protects us, doesn't he, from the evil one. And under his wings we'll find shelter. He will never leave us or forsake us. He says, come to me, you all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How can we refuse him? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You know, this amazing hymn came from the mouth of an Indian man in the 19th century whose wife and two children were murdered in front of him because of his refusal to deny Christ. And he watched that before his eyes. And then he himself was martyred. What courage, what faith. What an example to us all, and what a glorious crown awaited him in paradise. I have decided to follow Jesus, he said, as he murdered his family. So I'm coming to a conclusion. To put God first, then, is to deny oneself. To put others first, to consider others better than ourselves, to give the stranger the best seat in the house, to always give the biggest portion, to fast for a season so as to prioritise our prayer life, to give cheerfully, to forgive to encourage and build up one another, to spend time discipling young Christians, to leave our to love, <laughs> to love our enemies and not just our family and friends. To go the extra mile willingly, to never give up, but to run the race marked out for us, and all for Jesus. All for Jesus, who gave us his all, that we might have eternal life. He prayed the price in full. 
So let us too put in first in our lives whatever the cost. Yeah? To know the Lord then is to put him first and this means spending time with him. When Jesus returned from the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter and James and John, they met the other disciples who were involved in a dispute. Do you remember? When Jesus asked what the argument was about, it transpired that the disciples were unable to cast out a demon from a boy. Once Jesus prayed, however, the job was done immediately. The disciples, the disciples were perplexed, wondering why their, effort, why their efforts had failed. Why couldn't they do it? Jesus explained what was lacking from the disciples' efforts. He explained what was lacking and it was prayer. Because that fast into that. But basically it was prayer. And what is prayer then? But being totally in tune with God. To be totally concentrated on him. They couldn't cast out the demon through their own efforts, could they? For it's only through moving in the power of God that we can harness his power and do his work. We have to saturate ourselves with him. We have to give him our all. And then there's no job that we couldn't do for him through his power. He is the vine, we are the branches. And it's his sap that flows into us, but only when we're focused on him and nothing else. We really do need to fix our eyes on Jesus and never take them off. Seek first then the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all else will be added to you. That's Matthew 6.33. You know, we dishonoured God when our eagerness to serve him interferes with our first priority. And our first priority isn't healing the sick or raising the dead. It's not even making disciples of people. Our first priority above all else is to get to know him. To know him more than a brother. To know him more than a lover, a husband or a wife. Our first priority is also to allow him to know us because really that's how we get to know him isn't it we have to open up our own hearts we have to be willing to allow him in to every area of our lives i'm sure you may have just this comes to mind isn't it it's like jesus comes to visit or, or, or the great visitor comes to the house and, and you know we've got the front room ready we haven't been we don't even use the front room just to case the special visitor comes because it's always immaculate isn't it the front room's like the facade the, the, the bit we put on the nice bit you know nice trousers nice shirt get your hair cut get scrubbed up you're halfway there aren't you but what about the back room what about the other room that, you know we just hang out in with the fact I'm not looking at you for any particular reason what about the other room don't look at someone else now what about the other room that we, do, that we hang out in? It's a bit messy, you know, that maybe we wouldn't want to allow uh, this special visitor in. So. Maybe you'd be all right in there, but not the cellar. Goodness sake, you do not want to know what's been going on in the cellar, do you? You don't want to be getting anybody down there, do you? Well, isn't it true? Or the attic, that's another. <coughs> you know, the attic's probably just as bad. And what goes on up there, nobody wants to know. You certainly don't want to share it, do you? You wouldn't want to stand up here and start talking about what's going on in the cellar, would you? But you know, Jesus wants to go into every room. 
I've got to be willing to say, yeah, Lord, it's a bit dark down here. It's a bit dank and musty and smelly, Lord. But this is a part of the house, the temple, the temples of the Holy Spirit. And he wants to go down there with you and he wants to say, you know, I died, Nigel, so that we can clean this place up. Let's get some light on in the cellars of our lives. Yeah? Let's get into that acid and, and build these block builders here. What do you build? Door the windows so you can see out of them. So that God can come into every area of our life. We need to put God first above everything. And then we'll be transformed. And then we'll be empowered to really love our wives and our children and our and, and even our enemies. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Just finish in prayer and a cup of tea. Yeah. Father God, thank you, Lord, that there's nothing in us that could ever shock you, Lord. You know, you've seen it all. And your blood washes away and cleanses any sin. There's nothing we've done. There's nowhere we've been, Lord, that you're not willing to come with us and clean up, Lord. So right now, Lord, we just, we, 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 I just want us to, oh, I don't know. I want us just to just, just declare in your heart right now that you're willing, that if you are willing, to put him first. Let him be the centre. Let him come into every area of your life and minister to you there. There's no lie that he won't tear down. There's no wall that he won't kick down. As he comes after you, and I will tell you this, he will keep coming. He will keep coming until every wall and every defence that we put up is broken down. So I pray right now that you break down those walls of resistance that we put up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.